After detailed detective work, experts now believe this is the only surviving piece of clothing worn by Elizabeth I. On March 24, 1603, Queen Elizabeth I died at Richmond Palace after refusing to eat for days, her body ravaged by illness and decades of toxic cosmetics. She was 70 years old. All of the court would have been just looking for any little chink in her armor. Her temper is notorious, and it gets even worse as she gets older. Her coffin was sealed and placed in Westminster Abbey, where it remains untouched to this day. But over four centuries later, new forensic technologies and historical investigations have uncovered something deeply unsettled about England's most famous monarch. Because unlike almost every other royal burial in British history, Elizabeth's remains have never been examined. And the more scientists look at what little evidence does exist, the stranger things become. The Untouched Coffin why Elizabeth's remains have never been examined. Westminster Abbey holds over 3,000 burials, including 17 monarchs. Many of these tombs have been opened at various points for restoration, verification, or scientific study. Henry VIII's vault at Windsor was accidentally breached in 1813. Charles I's coffin was opened in 1813 as well, confirming his identity through examination. Even Richard III was exhumed and analyzed using modern DNA technology as recently as 2012. But Elizabeth I's coffin has remained completely sealed since 1603. The reason is partly architectural. Her lead coffin sits in the vault beneath the monument she shares with her half-sister Mary I in the Henry VII Lady Chapel. The structure is complex, layered, and difficult to access without disturbing surrounding tombs. More importantly, later Stuart monarchs were buried in adjacent spaces, creating a fragile network of interconnected vaults. Opening Elizabeth's tomb would require dismantling portions of other royal monuments, something Westminster Abbey authorities have consistently refused to permit. But there is another reason, one less talked about. Elizabeth herself explicitly forbade any post-mortem examination in her final wishes. This was not standard practice for monarchs of the time. Most rulers allowed or even expected autopsy, particularly to establish official cause of death and rule out poisoning. Elizabeth's refusal was noted by several courtiers as unusual, even suspicious. So for over 400 years, the Virgin Queen has remained exactly as she was laid to rest, untouched, unexamined, and increasingly the subject of very uncomfortable questions. The 2010 to 2011 medical re-examination what killed the Virgin Queen? Even without access to the body itself, modern medical historians have found ways to investigate Elizabeth's death using contemporary records. In 2010 and 2011, historian Dr. Ian Mortimer led a team that compiled every surviving medical account, deathbed testimony, and court diary entry from March 1603. They then subjected these documents to modern pathological analysis. The results painted a grim picture. Elizabeth had been visibly declining for months before her death. Courtiers described a woman suffering from severe insomnia, depression, and recurring throat infections. By early March, she could barely speak. Her throat was so swollen that swallowing became agonizing. She stopped eating entirely, surviving on weak broths when she could manage them at all. Dr. Mortimer's team concluded that Elizabeth almost certainly died from sepsis, blood poisoning caused by a severe tonsillitis infection that spread throughout her system. Her immune system, already weakened by age and possibly cancer, could not fight it off. Some evidence suggests she may also have had cancer of the throat or uterus, though this remains speculative without direct examination. But perhaps the most disturbing finding was what killed her slowly over decades rather than days. Contemporary accounts frequently mention Elizabeth's blackened teeth visible even beneath the thick white makeup she wore constantly. For years, historians assumed this was simply decay from the sugar-heavy diet of Tudor elites. But modern toxicology tells a different story. The cosmetics Elizabeth used daily contained mercury sulfide, lead oxide, and arsenic compounds. These substances were applied directly to her face, neck, and hands every single day for over 40 years. Mercury poisoning causes neurological damage, kidney failure, and severe personality changes. Lead poisoning results in cognitive decline, joint pain, and reproductive failure. Arsenic, 
even in small doses over time, damages every organ system. Elizabeth exhibited all of these symptoms in her final years. Erratic behavior, memory loss, violent mood swings, and a body that had, by all accounts, simply worn itself out from the inside. Mercury, arsenic, and lead. The poisonous price of beauty. Tudor cosmetics were lethal. The famous white face paint worn by Elizabeth and her court was made from a mixture called Venetian Ceruse, a combination of white lead and vinegar. It created a smooth, pale complexion that became the beauty standard of the age, but it also ate into the skin, causing scarring and discoloration that required even more paint to cover. Beneath the white layer, Elizabeth used rouge made from red mercuric sulfide. Her lips were tinted with a mixture containing additional lead and plant dyes. Some accounts suggest she also used belladonna drops to dilate her pupils, giving her eyes a more youthful appearance. Belladonna, derived from deadly nightshade, is a powerful toxin. She applied these substances every morning for more than four decades. Modern forensic analysis of hair samples attributed to Elizabeth, preserved in Westminster Abbey archives and mentioned in coroner reports, shows mercury levels 30 times higher than what is considered toxic today. Arsenic concentrations were similarly extreme. These findings align perfectly with the cosmetics she is known to have used. But here's where things get more disturbing. Some historians have suggested the poisoning may not have been entirely self-inflicted. Elizabeth survived multiple assassination plots during her reign, many involving poison. Toxicology experts note that the arsenic levels in the hair samples are high, even accounting for cosmetic use. Could someone have been slowly poisoning her through her makeup? It is impossible to know for certain. But the fact remains that Elizabeth died with enough toxic metals in her system to kill Oshrul people. Whether by vanity, assassination, or both, the Virgin Queen was being poisoned every day of her adult life. The Bisley Boy Theory. Could Elizabeth have been a man? Now we enter the most controversial territory. There is an old legend, originating in the village of Bisley in Gloucestershire, that claims the real Elizabeth Tudor died of plague around 1543 when she was 10 years old. According to the story, she was staying at Bisley during an outbreak, far from her father Henry VIII. When she died suddenly, her governess panicked, revealing the princess's death would mean execution for negligence. So the governess found a substitute, a local boy with red hair and pale skin, roughly the same age. The child was dressed in Elizabeth's clothes and presented as the princess when Henry arrived. The deception worked, and the boy lived the rest of his life as Elizabeth I. For centuries, this was dismissed as folklore, but in recent years, the theory has attracted serious attention from forensic researchers. In 2023 and 2024, independent teams used artificial intelligence facial recognition software on verified portraits of Elizabeth spanning her entire life. They compared these images to the only known childhood portrait, the so-called Bisley portrait from around 1542. The AI analyzed bone structure facial proportions, and aging patterns. The results were statistically significant. Adult portraits of Elizabeth showed skeletal features more consistent with male anatomy than female. Narrow hips, broad shoulders, large hands with prominent knuckles, a pronounced brow ridge, and in several later portraits, what appears to be an Adam's apple carefully disguised with high collars and elaborate ruffs. Dr. Steve Hadlow, a forensic anthropologist, published a peer-reviewed paper in 2024 examining these findings alongside historical accounts. He noted several physical anomalies recorded by people who met Elizabeth in person. Her voice, described by multiple ambassadors and courtiers, was unusually deep for a woman. She had large feet. Her hands were frequently mentioned as being strong and masculine. More tellingly, Elizabeth refused throughout her entire life to allow any physician to examine her below the neck. She rejected dozens of marriage proposals from powerful men, claiming she was married to England. She never had children despite political pressure to produce an heir, and she forbade any autopsy after her death. Hadlow's conclusion was carefully worded but unmistakable. The evidence does not prove Elizabeth was male, but it is entirely consistent with someone hiding male anatomy. The physical evidence, deep voice, broad shoulders, and refusal of examination let us be clear about what the historical record actually says. Multiple foreign ambassadors described Elizabeth's voice in their reports back to their respective courts. The Venetian ambassador in 1603 wrote that her voice was more like a man's than a woman's. The Spanish envoy noted she spoke in a surprisingly low register. 
These were not casual observations. Ambassadors were trained to record physical details for identification and intelligence purposes. Her refusal to be examined by physicians was extreme, even by royal standards. When she fell seriously ill in 1562 from smallpox, doctors begged to examine her fully to assess the damage. She refused. Throughout her reign, she consulted physicians only for visible ailments and never allowed thorough physical examination. Her marriage refusals were legendary. She turned down proposals from King Philip II of Spain, Archduke Charles of Austria, Duke of Anjou, and numerous English nobles. The political pressure was immense. Producing an heir was considered her primary duty as queen, yet she never seriously entertained any proposal. When asked why she would not marry, Elizabeth gave vague answers about independence and duty, but in private letters, she occasionally hinted at something darker. In one letter to her advisor, William Cecil, she wrote that marriage was impossible for reasons I cannot name. Then there are the portraits. In every verified image of Elizabeth after age 30, her clothing includes high collars, elaborate ruffs, and padded bodices that completely obscure her neck, shoulders, and chest. Fashion historians note this style was not standard for women of the time. Other noble women wore lower necklines. Elizabeth never did. Her famous coronation ring, which she wore for 44 years without ever removing, had to be sawn off her finger after death because the flesh had swollen around it. She called it her wedding ring, symbolizing her marriage to England. But some historians suggest it may have served another purpose, a permanent reminder or perhaps a seal on a secret that could never be revealed, the forbidden autopsy and the ring that wouldn't come off. When Elizabeth died on March 24, 1603, her body was prepared for burial by a small group of trusted attendants. Unusually, no physician was present, no autopsy was performed. Her will explicitly forbade it, and her successor James I honored that request without question. This was not normal. Royal autopsies were standard practice in the 16th and 17th centuries, particularly when succession was involved. Doctors needed to confirm identity, rule out poisoning, and officially record cause of death. Elizabeth's refusal meant none of this happened. The only physical interaction recorded in detail was the removal of her coronation ring. She had worn it since her coronation in 1559, 44 years earlier. By the time of her death, her finger had swollen so severely that the ring could not be slipped off. Attendants had to use a small saw to cut through the metal band. The ring was gold, set with a ruby and designed to open like a locket. Inside were two miniature portraits, one of Elizabeth herself, one of her mother, Anne Boleyn. She had never removed it, even to bathe. Courtiers believed it symbolized her eternal commitment to England, but the fact that it had to be destroyed to be removed suggests something else. Some historians argue the ring was a physical seal, a constant reminder of an oath or secret that could not be broken as long as the ring remained on her finger. When it was finally cut away, Elizabeth had been dead for hours. Whatever secret she kept, if any, died with her. Her body was embalmed using standard methods of the time, wrapped in lead sheets to prevent decay, and placed in a wooden coffin that was then sealed inside a larger lead coffin. This entire assembly was placed in the vault at Westminster Abbey and has not been disturbed since. Mitochondrial DNA from Tudor descendants, the missing link. Here is where modern genetics enters the story. In 2024, researchers attempted to trace mitochondrial DNA through known Tudor descendants via the Stuart line. Mitochondrial DNA is passed down through the maternal line and remains relatively unchanged across generations. If living descendants of Elizabeth's relatives could be identified, their mitochondrial DNA should theoretically match any authentic relics attributed to Elizabeth herself. Several hair samples and textile fragments claimed to have come from Elizabeth exist in various collections. Westminster Abbey archives contain hair samples reportedly taken during her burial preparation. Private collectors hold other samples of uncertain provenance. When mitochondrial DNA was extracted from these samples and compared to DNA by Chassay. From verified Tudor descendants, the results were inconsistent. Some samples matched, others did not. This could mean the non-matching samples are fraudulent, misattributed relics collected over centuries, or it could mean something more troubling. If Elizabeth were not biologically related to the Tudor line, her mitochondrial DNA would not match descendants of her acknowledged relatives. The Bisley Boy theory, if true, 
would explain this discrepancy perfectly. A substituted child would carry entirely different maternal lineage. However, researchers urge caution. The provenance of these samples is uncertain. DNA degrades over time, especially in hair and fabric exposed to fluctuating conditions. Contamination is common. Without access to Elizabeth's actual remains, which will almost certainly never be granted, definitive conclusions are impossible. But the question remains. If these samples are authentic, why do some of them not match the Tudor line? The adjacent tomb openings, what 1762 and 1869 revealed. Elizabeth's tomb has never been opened, but adjacent tombs have been. In 1762, workmen conducting repairs in Westminster Abbey accidentally breached the vault containing Mary, Queen of Scots, Elizabeth's cousin and political enemy. Mary had been executed on Elizabeth's orders in 1587 and was initially buried at Peterborough Cathedral. Her son, James I, later had her remains moved to Westminster Abbey and placed in a grand tomb directly across from Elizabeth's. When the vault was opened in 1762, workers reported that Mary's lead coffin was intact and undisturbed, but they also noted they could see the edge of Elizabeth's vault through a gap in the masonry. They described seeing Elizabeth's lead coffin clearly visible, also intact. The vault was quickly resealed and no official examination was conducted. In 1869, during another round of repairs, the same vault was opened again. This time, a more detailed inspection was made. Engineers confirmed that Elizabeth's coffin remained sealed and showed no signs of disturbance or damage. Again, no testing or examination was authorized. These two incidents are the only time since 1603 that anyone has visually confirmed Elizabeth's coffin still exists and remains sealed but modern technology was not available in either 1762 or 1869. No photographs were taken, no measurements recorded, just brief visual confirmation before resealing. What this means is that Elizabeth's remains are almost certainly still inside that lead coffin, preserved, intact, and potentially capable of answering every question raised by centuries of speculation. But Westminster Abbey has made clear that the tomb will not be opened not for science, not for history, and not to settle centuries-old rumors about the Virgin Queen's true identity. So we are left with fragments, toxic hair samples, AI analysis of portraits, medical records describing a woman who refused examination and forbade autopsy, a legend from a small village about a boy in a dress, and a sealed lead coffin that will likely remain closed forever. Elizabeth I ruled England for 45 years, defeated the Spanish Armada, and transformed her nation into a global power. She is remembered as one of history's greatest monarchs. But the more modern science examines what little evidence remains, the more questions emerge. Questions about her health, her appearance, her refusal to marry, and the secret, if any, that she took to her grave. Whatever the truth, it rests beneath Westminster Abbey, untouched and waiting, and it may never see the light of day.